Okay. Then we get to the second keynote of EuroPython. Um, you ready? Yeah. Okay. You're ready as well? Okay, yes, you're ready. <laughs> okay, so. I have one uh, question. So, um, we've been with EuroPython to Florence, Bilbao, and Rimini. And who thinks it's too cold here in Edinburgh? <laughs> okay. Who thinks it's too hot in Edinburgh? I wasn't aware of so many locals around. So, <laughs> okay. But if you think like 22 degrees in Edinburgh is too cold, let me tell you about some guys in Antarctica. They probably have like minus uh, 80 degrees Celsius now, and we're now going live to basically the other side of the world. You see them already sitting there. They are more isolated than the astronauts on the ISS because there's only certain time spots where they actually can leave the Antarctica station. And they're going to tell you a lot about their work, their research, the team in a bit. So please give them a warm welcome to Antarctica. I hold up. I was supposed to be there uh, with you also this year, uh, but uh, actually I'm a little bit far from uh, Europe. Uh, this, as Alexander told you before, is uh, Concordia Station. It's the European uh, outpost in Antarctica, in the middle of Antarctica. And uh, it's a French-Italian uh, facility. And uh, during the winter season, it hosts uh, 13 uh, odd people guys <laughs> and uh, we are uh, yes the more isolated on earth more than the astronauts in the international space station uh, because between february and um, uh, november um, there is no way to move uh, from here and uh, no one can come because the temperature is really low it can be lower than uh, minus 80 celsius degrees and now I, I want to share a little bit of, uh, I share the screen because I want to show you a little bit of slides. And so uh, we will see in about uh, five minutes. Just one second. Okay. No, it's not okay. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So Concordia is uh, 1,200 kilometers far, far from the closest base on the coast. And there are 3.2 kilometers of snow and ice under it. There is lack of oxygen because the air is rarefied as uh, it is at 4,000 meters of altitude at normal latitudes. And it's highly dry because uh, this is the largest desert on uh, Earth. There is no life here except of us. And the last time we saw the sun was exactly 80 days ago. Concordia is the most similar place on Earth to another planet. And that's why the European Space Agency is making biological research on us in order to better understand how the human body behaves in a such extraterrestrial environment. So, imagine to have uh, a continent 1.5 times larger than uh, Europe, totally covered by, from a layer of two kilometers of ice and snow. That's Antarctica, the highest continent on Earth with an average of altitude of uh, two kilometers from the sea level. Approximately 61% of all fresh water on the Earth, basically potable water, is here. If you melt all this size, the fresh water, the, the, the sea level will increase uh, everywhere of 48 meters. During the Antarctic winter between February and November, the total population of the continent is more or less the people in your room. Most of, the, most of them live in the coast and a few in the middle of the plateau. In fact, there are only three permanent bases in the middle of Antarctica. Concordia Bay is with 13 people, the Vostok Bay is managed by Russia with 13 people as well, 
and also a USA base with 45 people. The population here is, uh, is here in order to perform uh, scientific research, because I hope this place will be took as an example for the rest of the world, because it's a huge laboratory for science where nations co cooperate peacefully to reach a common purpose. The goal to know more about our planet and universe. Okay, no. Okay, to have power, we use uh, three generators. One generates until 100 kilowatt, and two until 150 kilowatt. We consume about uh, 5,000 liters of fuel per month, and uh, this fuel is similar to kerosene with additives in order to move down its freezing temperature to minus 55 Celsius degrees. It's stored outside uh, the base, and we keep uh, about 25 uh, cubic meters always warm in order for them to be immediately available. The fuel and the majority of the food comes uh, here transported by some caterpillar, like the one we, you see in the picture. And uh, it's driven by around 12 people. It's a long trip of about uh, 15 days. 1,300 kilometers starting from the coast. And they usually travel twice a year, exclusively during the summer season, of course, because the, the, in winter time, Concordia is uh, unattainable. Okay, as I told you before, uh, we are here to perform uh, scientific research in different fields. Uh, one of them is astronomy, and uh, that's my duty. And uh, we have two telescopes observing the sky, the optical frequencies. The one you see in the picture on the left uh, follows just one star for the whole winter, because we expect to the transit of a planet, and maybe we are lucky also some moons. And uh, why is this place so important for astronomy? because uh, there are no artificial lights and no humidity, and so the sky is really clear. But also because we have three months of dark, so we can observe continuously, uh, as uh, we can only from space. Uh, Python is the most used programming language here. But uh, programming, programming is hard, and uh, contributing to open source projects is almost impossible because uh, we only have uh, 512 uh, kilobit of bandwidth for all the stations. Uh, we don't have internet uh, on our personal computers, and uh, to access the network, we use a common desktop. Now, uh, I show you just a couple of pictures before introducing my colleagues. This one is uh, Concordia at sunset. Uh, I took this picture at the beginning of uh, the winter. That's the last time uh, we saw the sun. It was uh, 80 days ago. And uh, this one this, uh, this, uh, fee -fee, uh, under the moon. And also, this picture is uh, at the beginning of the winter. <laughs> okay, now it's time for Coco. Colin uh, will speak about uh, glaciology. So hello everybody, I'm uh, Colin, as I uh, just told you, uh, Marco, and uh, me, I'm a glaciologist here. I will uh, then uh, speak a little bit about glaciology and uh, with a PowerPoint. You can uh, share the...
Okay. So uh, why are we study glaciology here? Uh, here, glaciology is a tool to better understand uh, our surrounding climate, so in the present day, but as well on the past. And uh, here is a very good environment because uh, we don't have a lot of pollution around because uh, Antarctica is uh, it's really desertic. And uh, because uh, but at least uh, we are uh, three kilometers above the, the ice. So here on the, on the cross section, you can... Um, you can see where we are, so but it's not really complicated, uh, Basque Concordia, here. Uh, uh, so it means that uh, we are on the, what we call the high plateau of uh, Antarctica, and uh, here is uh, very good to realize uh, ice uh, core uh, drilling. Why? Because uh, as we are on the plateau, we are almost in the middle of the ice cap, <clears throat> and uh, so there is absolutely no velocity. So. No velocity means uh, that the layer of ice are not disturbed uh, going uh, on in the depths. <coughs> After it's very good because uh, but so we have a lot of ice, three kilometers, and uh, the accumulation of uh, snow equivalent ice is very very low. And, uh, we have approximately two millimeter of ice corresponding to one year. Um, why uh, why we are doing? Um, uh, some uh, ice uh, core. It's uh, wait, yeah. It's uh, it's because uh, so I told you I, we want to understand better the climate of the past. So uh, the snow when it's uh, falling, uh, it uh, it captures some uh, some air and some uh, particles of uh, the atmosphere. After it's uh, going to compact it and uh, become ice. The ice is a uh, imperm impermeable uh, material. And so those uh, bubbles of uh, air stay in prison into the ice. So in practical, this is uh, what we are doing. So on the first picture on the left, you see the ice, which is into the drilling instrument. Just um, uh, under it, you see the ice coming out, the, the drilling uh, instrument. And on the right, this is uh, the section of ice that we analyze. And what we analyze on it, we don't analyze all the ice, but we analyze the bubble of air, which are uh, uh, in prison on the ice. And uh, so, as this is snow accumulation at the beginning, if you remember, uh, in the surface, this is uh, at the present day, more or less, whereas uh, at uh, more, the more you go on, uh, on depth, and uh, the more you can find information of the past. With Epica, uh, we, we drill for three kilometers, <clears throat> and so we arrive uh, to uh, 800,000 years ago. So we, we arrive to get some information uh, about a long, long time ago. So the main results of, uh, of this, I am. And, um, and so main of, uh, main of um, I tell you that we analyze uh, those uh, ice core, but uh, now we have uh, analyzed only one quarter of uh, the ice core. And all the rest is uh, is uh, keeping uh, kept uh, here because the Antarctica is the biggest uh, freezer of uh, the world. So why not keep the ice here? Um, so the main uh, results of uh, Epica it's uh, really uh, what we're talking uh, now in the present day. It's uh, the correlation uh, between the temperature and the, the greenhouse gases uh, concentration. So here on you can see that uh, when the concentration is the pressure sorry is going up the co2 for example and methane are uh, following the same train so with the pika we could have we can have a, a focus more about uh, the, um, the consequence of uh, the augmentation of uh, greenhouse gases uh, on the temperature of the atmosphere but um, uh, we wanted, uh, there is another project now running uh, because uh, Epica finished in 2005, 6 uh, more or less. And so we want to perform another drilling at uh, 40 kilometers far from Concordia, where uh, we think that we can find some ice of uh, 1 million years ago or uh, up to uh, probably 1.5 million years ago. So why uh, we want to perform another drilling and uh, why it is interesting on it? The project is called uh, Beyond the Pika Oldest Ice. And uh, we are interested in uh, going uh, more than uh, one million years ago because the cycle of glaciation and interglaciation uh, until uh, one million years ago was a cycle of uh, 100,000 years. 
Whereas after uh, one uh, million years ago, the cycle are way more uh, shorter. And uh, this is like uh, the cycle takes uh, more or less uh, 40,000 years ago. This formation you, we have uh, thanks to uh, sediment uh, cores or uh, some uh, like uh, information of the obliquity of the earth and uh, this kind of uh, parameters. Um, so that's why if we, if we arrive to perform a drilling after one million years ago, then um, we think that we can uh, have more information about why the period of glaciation becomes shorter. And uh, there is um, as well a technological uh, uh, goal on this, is because Epica was what we call the destroyed, um, destroyed drilling. It means that uh, we put the drilling instrument to the ice, we take the ice, we bring it up in the surface, then we bring it uh, to Europe, and uh, in Europe we make the analysis. Whereas here we develop, uh, so you can see on the picture, uh, here you have the heating uh, fingers, so it melts uh, the ice uh, when you go down, and after uh, somewhere on this tube, you have uh, the spectrometer. The spectrometer is what uh, allows us to analyze, to analyze uh, the, the bubble of, of the gas and so the past position of the atmosphere. It's uh, way more fast than uh, to take out all the ice core and everything. And uh, so in, uh, normally in one year, so in one uh, summer campaign, we will have uh, performed all this drilling and so have immediate uh, results on uh, the composition of those bubble of uh, gas. So this is the new project of uh, Concordia. Uh, unfortunately, those, uh, dr those uh, drilling and those uh, huge projects are performed only in summer, because uh, the problem is that um, in the winter the drilling, like uh, yeah, it's more complicated to perform drilling because of the instrument, because of the electronic inside, because uh, you you have more chance to put uh, your drilling instrument uh, like uh, stock stock. stock uh, on, on the ice, and, uh, but uh, we are still doing uh, glaciology during winter, but at more small scale, so more in the surface. And so here you can see, for example, that uh, we are making uh, what we call snow pits. So you dig a hole in the snow and uh, you, you take uh, samples, you take temperature for instance, you take some physical properties of the snow to better understand the, climate, the present climate and uh, the climate of the past. And so for uh, the Glaciology, I will stop here, and uh, thank you for listening. Thanks, Coco. Yeah, hello, everybody. I am Cyprien Verseau, and I'm the station leader of the base. But I'm also a glaciologist. But don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to talk about snow again. Um, because actually, glaciology is not my background. Normally, I'm a biologist. I'm doing space biology. And um, well, the reason why I'm here is not so much for my uh, background in glaciology, because I've been trained specifically for coming here, but it's because I've been doing other missions in isolated and confined environments, um, one of which I'm going to talk about as soon as we can get our computer to work. Just, <laughs> just a few seconds. Okay, let's go. Okay, it's coming. Okay, so, so the mission I was talking about is called High Cities 4, and it's a mission which is funded by NASA, and the purpose was to simulate a one-year mission on Mars. And the reason why NASA is funding this program is, is because... <laughs> and the reason why NASA is funding this program is because it's planning to send humans to Mars in the 2030s, even though their exact plan is not very uh, clear yet. But there are still some questions to answer, including 
whether astronauts, after spending months in isolation and confinement, would still be able to perform at a high level and would still be able to work as a team. And to answer this question and some others, NASA is funding a program called HISIS, um, which is basically simulations of missions to Mars, which happen in this dome here, which is about 11 meters in diameter, and which is isolating the slope of the Mauna, Lo the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. And there, crew of six people spend different periods of time, going from four, uh, four months to one year. There was one one-year mission and in which I, I took part. And there, during those missions, the six people live as if they were on Mars, which means, for instance, that they don't interact in real time with anybody, because the only way to talk to people is using emails with a delay in 20 minutes in both directions, which means that you send an email, it takes 20 minutes to arrive, and then after the person has answered, it takes again 20 minutes to come back to you. So for a year, I have not talked to or seen anybody besides my five crewmates. Another uh, important particularity of this is that the crew members are never exposed to fresh air or sunlight. Uh, because when they go outside, about once or twice a week maximum, they have some um, analogs of spacesuits, which I'm going to show a bit later. This is how it looks uh, inside the dome. Just waiting a few seconds for the, okay. Uh, it's, uh, so this is how it looks inside the zone. As you can see, it's like, uh, basically, it looks like a bit like the hemispheric uh, movie theaters. So it's quite, uh, quite voluminous. It gives an impression of space, even though the surface is quite small. And we have basically one big room on the lower floor. And then you have a mezzanine with uh, some bedrooms. It's the drawers that you can see. And those bedrooms are basically the size of uh, big closets. And uh, there is very, very little sun insulation, which is actually funny because just by listening, I could always know where my crewmates were and what they were doing. You know, there was very, um, there was a lot of, let's say, proximity. You really had uh, no intimacy. As for resources, uh, we were basically behaving as if we were on Mars. And so for food, for instance, we had only freeze-dried food, or mostly freeze-dried food. Uh, you can see some examples here with some uh, cubes of uh, dehydrated chicken, dried cherries, dried vegetables, and so on. Simply because on a trip to Mars, you would uh, basically bring some food that you can store for extended periods of time. And we did grow a little bit of uh, fresh food using basically what we could find. But um, well, to be true, the amounts were quite limited. Uh, there you can see our first harvest of uh, cherry tomatoes. As you can see, it's not a crazy amount. And uh, this is our bathroom, and uh, you can see that there is, a, there is a toilet. But the toilet, since we have to spare as much water as possible, was a dry toilet, which means that you go there, uh, you do what you have to do, and then back to you take care of turning what you produce into some things that smells uh, a bit less. And water also will be very, as I said, water will be very precious. And you can see that we have a shower, which would be quite a luxury for a Mars mission. But since we are, we're saving as much as possible, um, we're talking about two showers of about 30 seconds each a week. And then we're collecting the water and using it for uh, cleaning the ground. What we're doing most of the time was research. We all had our own research projects. Uh, because we're all researchers or engineers or something approaching, uh, but we were mostly test subjects. Here, for instance, you can see um, that I was taking some uh, some hair samples from a crewmate of mine, which was an analyze for uh, looking at stress hormones. And we also gave urine samples, um, saliva samples. We had questionnaires. We had uh, various tests. We tested some technologies, for instance, um, the trial reality goggles to say, mitigate the effects of isolation confinement. Uh, our sleep was monitored. Our physical activity was monitored. We also had some, uh, so, something which is called sociometric badges, which are basically some devices that we're wearing around our necks. And they were able to know who we were talking to, how we were talking to them, how close we were, and, uh, and so on. We also had some, uh, some experiments outside. We had, for instance, some collaboration experiments uh, where we had some objectives that we had to reach together. And where we interacted was, uh, was uh, rated. We also had some geology uh, tasks to perform in, in real conditions as if we were doing similar work on Mars. We were working on the ground outside or under the ground in uh, what is called lava tubes.
And in addition to that, we also had um, uh, we also had our own research projects. So there, I was working, for instance. Oh, yeah, that, that's me when I was uh, when I was younger. Um, I was a PhD student back then, and I was working on the development of uh, technologies that could allow you to produce what you need on Mars from what is already there using Mac. So yeah, that's me, and that's mostly why I'm here. And here I'm not doing bi biology simply because well, it's, it's so cold outside that uh, you have no plants, no animals, and even microbes do not proliferate. Uh, so if you find them, just work carried by the wind and don't really, uh, divide. So that's basically why I came here, and uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Moreno Paricevic. Uh, in the real life, uh, I work as computer scientist for the Italian National Research Council. And here in Concordia, I cover the position of electroscience, which uh, basically means uh, that I take care of both the hardware and the software side of uh, data acquisition or uh, the experiments we are conducting here. Uh, I'm responsible for 12 experiments in geophysics, among which uh, the and the observatory for seismology, geomagnetism, and uh, space weather. Uh, usually when you think uh, about Antarctica, you see something like this. Uh, you should see a picture. So you should see the continent covered by ice. <coughs> and uh, why it's important to uh, make research in this part of the world is that uh, is because uh, the southern uh, hemisphere, as you can see from, uh, from the next picture, is uh, covered mostly by the oceans, 80% is water, and the Antarctica itself to cover the, the southwest part uh, of the planet. And uh, um, the, the southern hemisphere is not as densely populated as the northern one. We have uh, less observatories, we have less stations. And in Antarctica, it's extremely important to, uh, to have uh, uh, as much as possible uh, observation points. And we have one here for various experiments. And uh, uh, concerning seismology, uh, the continent resides completely on a stable tectonic plate, as you can see in the picture. Uh, so it means there are no local events. Whatever we are registering, uh, registering here with the seismometers are events that happen somewhere else in the world. And uh, so there's no much noise uh, from, uh, from activities. Uh, our station is isolated, so there are no, especially in winter, there's no movements uh, or anything that can interfere with, uh, with the measurements. And of course, earthquakes, uh, um, use a seismic wave that propagates uh, inside, uh, inside the planets, and they carry some information uh, due to the fact that, that the propagation is affected by some phenomena like a reflection and uh, something that resemble um, refraction as well. And there are some effects uh, that are introduced in the propagation of the waves, uh, like delays, uh, changes of phase, uh, or uh, polarization, attenuation, there are echoes, and so forth. And all the information these waves carries gives a lot of information, a lot of insights about the, the inner part of our planet. And most of the information we have about uh, the, the planet, like uh, the solid uh, core, the solid inner core, the liquid uh, uh, inner core, the low mantle, the upper mantle, and the crust, uh, all comes from uh, these kind of stuff. Uh, as you can see, this is just a plot of an earthquake. You can see. Oh, you're going to see that, not seeing yet. Uh, okay, that's it. And uh, you can see that there are several waves. They propagate with different speeds and different, uh, depending on the material they are crossing and so forth. So this is uh, an example of what we detect here with the centimeters. Uh, but as well, we can detect other phenomena, like uh, in this case is an eruption of a volcano at Hawaii in, uh, in May of this year. And as well, we can detect uh, some local events in the next picture, you're going to see some spikes. And uh, those are just the ice cracks uh, that uh, happen sometimes when the, the different in, in temperature is, uh, is higher. In this case, it was a delta in temperature of like uh, 20 degrees. And the ice was literally cracking, and we can as well. Uh, 
but as well we detect the activity and uh, in the next uh, picture you will see it is the, the traverse the ride uh, the caterpillar that brings the container with fuels uh, the food and all the material we need uh, we need on this station as well, uh, uh, since we are located close to the South Pole, uh, we are studying geomagnetism, of course. And uh, as you probably know, <laughs> we have uh, a North and a South Pole, geographic poles, and they uh, are related to the uh, rotation axis of the, uh, of the planet. But as well, we have magnetic poles, and these poles do not coincide with the geographic poles, and they are continually moving. And so the measurement we are taking here allows to track uh, the, the motion of, uh, of these poles. And uh, as well, we have uh, what we call the, the geomagnetic poles that belongs to another um, coordinate system. And uh, this uh, is corresponded to a perfect dipole that passes through the center of the planet. And that is, usual, is usually used for numerical modeling. And that also explain uh, why uh, the um, aurora oval is uh, it's centered above us and not on the south pole or the magnetic pole. Uh, the south pole uh, um, corresponds uh, to the Amundsen Scott Station, and uh, the, the magnetic pole is 100 kilometers far away from the coast, uh, um, close to the DDU, the Dumont-Durville uh, French Station on the coast, and the geomagnetic pole is close to us. As well, we conduct studies uh, concerning the space weather, so the interaction between the, the solar activity and the magnetosphere, the higher atmosphere. And uh, this phenomena is uh, particularly important close to the, to the poles because uh, uh, there are particles that are injected into the atmosphere and that uh, can interfere as well uh, uh, with various human activity, both in space and on the planet and especially for what is concerned about uh, the, uh, the satellite uh, operativity and uh, telecommunication as well, uh, the power grid, uh, the electricity distribution basically in Earth. Uh, here uh, I take care about, uh, of about 50 computers of different form factors from uh, rack-mounted servers uh, to embed the devices, appliances, uh, uh, Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, and whatever other device we can use uh, for, uh, for data acquisition. Uh, we use uh, Python mainly for uh, pre and processing of data, validation of data, visualization of data, but the, most of the data we collect are sent uh, to the uh, search groups in Europe where the data is further analyzed and then uh, contribute to create models at geographical uh, and global scale. Uh, concerning the telecommunication here, I'm seen yet, uh, he, uh, take care of the maintenance and the administration of the local area network and as well uh, of the telecommunication via satellite and via radio. Uh, we have a satellite connection of 500 kilobit per second, so we are very limited in whatever activity we are conducting here. Uh, for instance, for this conference, uh, the bandwidth is completely dedicated to the connection, otherwise it wouldn't be possible. And while well, we are sharing the same connection for email, uh, whatever other service uh, that uh, we need at the station, like web browsing, uh, research, and whatever. And we send all this data to Europe. So a larger part of the bandwidth is dedicated just to send this data via SSH, R-Sync, and whatever, this tunnel to Europe, where the other groups are analyzing this kind of data. And, uh, uh, OK, we are cutting. Sorry. OK, it's time for. Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is Carmen Bosnik and I'm, uh, yeah. I'm uh, here working for the European Space Agency and um, so ESA sends a doctor down here every year uh, to uh, study the uh, adaptation of the human body to these extreme environments here uh, and this is a perfect spot to do this because uh, Concordia is uh, the best analogon we have on Earth to uh, a base on Mars for example or to a long distance space flight. Um, this is, of course, because of the extreme environment we have outside. So we have the cold that um, 
forces us to uh, dress up accordingly before we go outside. We have the three and a half months of darkness, uh, the complete isolation during the winter months, and a small crew size, so we are 13 people for uh, nine months. Um, and uh, all this makes it a perfect uh, place to study for uh, future human spaceflight missions. Um, so I have four different experiments for different uh, scientists, uh, laboratories th throughout Europe. Um, two of which um, are concerning the immune system. So what I do is, uh, well, basically I study my uh, crew members here. I take monthly uh, blood samples and uh, urine samples and stool samples and hair samples and saliva and all that fun stuff. And I uh, analyze it in a little lab I have here. Um, at, with two studies, I'm looking at the uh, evolution of the immune cells in the isolation, uh, which is very interesting because, of, uh, as Leanne told you, we have no microbes outside that could attack us. And since we are always the same 13 people inside here, there's also nothing new uh, coming from us anymore after a few months. So uh, we are looking at how the immune cells uh, react to this kind of uh, stress. And uh, what we can see now is that in the first months, um, also because of the hyperbaric hypoxia we have here, um, in the first months, uh, actually the activity of the immune cells is decreasing because they have nothing to do. But uh, as soon as it turns to chronic um, hypoxia status, uh, we can see that the immune cells are actually uh, having an overreaction and uh, doing more than they were doing than they would usually do in back in Europe, for example. Which is also why uh, we usually uh, get sick as soon as the new summer people come in around November. Um, so this is quite interesting. And then another study um, uh, looks at the acclimatization of our bodies to the hypoxia and uh, well, the high altitude, practically. So you can never really uh, adapt to this, but you can uh, acclimatize. Um, we are at uh, 3,300 meters, with, um, which is about uh, 3,800 as it would be on, um, around Europe. Um, yeah. So um, <laughs> basically, this is also blood tests and uh, urine tests and um, a lot, lots of questionnaires on the altitude sickness. And uh, well, the fourth experiment is um, concerning the decrease of uh, piloting skills and fine motor skills. So um, Mario is going to put a picture. <laughs> we, what we have here is a, a simulator of a Soyuz capsule which is, of course, the space rocket that uh, currently brings astronauts to the ISS. And, um, yeah, you can see it here. So uh, this is, uh, well, it's like a computer game, basically. <laughs> um, it's the cockpit of the Soyuz with three monitors, two joysticks. And what we do is we uh, fly the, the Soyuz to the ISS and we dock. And uh, my crewmates do this every month, and I monitor their skills, and uh, along with other fine motor tests and cognitive tests and more questionnaires, I look at how their skills are improving or decreasing or staying the same here during the isolation period. And this, of course, is uh, very important, because if you send a crew of astronauts to Mars, for example, you want to make absolutely sure that once they arrive, they will still be able to land the spaceship on Mars and, uh, well, and return safely home back to Earth as well, of course. So yeah, that's what I'm doing here. Okay, we take... We take just a couple of minutes for Fifi. Hello everybody, I'm Filippo Caliquaglia, I'm a physicist and I'm here, I'm here for taking care about uh, around uh, three projects mainly. Uh, these projects uh, concern meteorology, so all kind of meteorological measurements. Uh, the study of the solar radiation. We have a, <coughs> uh, um, a, solar, a solar radiation observatory uh, linked to uh, like a, a worldwide network for measuring radiation, uh, incoming, uh, outcoming, and all sort of all this kind of of diff all different wavelength, and uh, <clears throat> and also I'm running a measurement with, through a lidar facility, which uh, that allows us to um, to study the lower stratosphere, uh, uh, where the the polar stratospheric clouds form and dissolve and enhance the 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 dissolution of the ozone and and um, 
uh, as you can see in this picture, that will uh, soon arrive from Antarctica to Edinburgh, I hope. This is uh, our LiDAR facilities, facility, which is uh, located in a shelter outside the base, uh, around uh, some hundred meters uh, out of the base. And um, um, in the next picture, you will see the, um, the, the facility for the measurement of the solar of the radiation. And the uh, radiometers uh, measuring uh, long wave and short wave are uh, situated are located on a, a device called the solar tracker, tracker which allows uh, um, this instrument to follow the sun and uh, perform these kind of measurements. And uh, at the end, I have the, um, I have the, um, as I told you, we are measuring temperature, uh, humidity, and, and so forth. And uh, I will just briefly show, show you a plot, um, and I, you will probably recognize that it has been made with Python. And um, okay, and this is one of um, this is a plot showing wind chill, uh, which is uh, an interesting um, measure uh, that um, combines uh, temperature and wind speed, and allows us to have, uh, in just in a glance, have uh, an idea of what's the, what's the weather like outside. <clears throat> As you can see from the st statistics uh, in the bottom of the screen, uh, we reached the temperature of wind chill temperature of. Uh, uh, minus 99, while the minimum temperature, real temperature we reached during this uh, this winter, until now it's uh, around the minus 77.1, which is not uh, is not the, the is not a record, but uh, I can tell you that it's already uh, quite a fresh uh, environment, very fresh and cold environment. And um, lastly, <clears throat> every day I'm performing a radio sounding. It means that I'm launching a balloon full of helium uh, in order to track the condition of the of the atmosphere of the lower atmosphere. Uh, it means uh, um, from the ground uh, until uh, uh, 30 kilometers in the summer and uh, uh, only 15 during this time of the year. And uh, for the re this reason, uh, we, we with the collaboration of my crewmates, uh, we prepared. Uh, uh, a special balloon, a special edition balloon, just uh, to celebrate this uh, Skype uh, uh, with you. And so, um, please, Mark, help me. Uh. Okay. We will launch this balloon uh, tomorrow evening, and um, and uh, and uh, we hope that uh, it will reach a really high elevation altitude, and uh, it will uh, measure for for us. Uh, um, it will measure uh, temperature, relative humidity, and all these kind of variables that are really important for studying atmosphere, for meteorological reason, and for better understand and better improve our models. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I don't know. I'm, I don't know whether you can actually see this. Oh, actually, it's swipped. You can't see this. So this is the audience. So please get hand to Antarctica waving. I hope you can see this. Yeah. Um, so the full room. We have like another five minutes for two questions. If you have a question, please come here and. Be quick, because we already have a little delay. So, which Python version do you use? <laughs> oh, good. Is that a trick question? Which Python version do you use? No, do we, what is it? A trick question? No. No. Okay. I think you need to repeat your question. Oh, uh, which Python version do you use? Asks Jill. Uh, Python 2.7. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Filippo is coding in Python uh, 3.6. Hey. I'm sorry to tell you that I'm not yet at the development level, but uh, I'm, I'm working hard, so maybe we will meet uh, in some years, a few years, the uh, next PyCon. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I have a question about this NASA experiment uh, on people behavior. Uh, how um, do... There's a question on uh, the NASA experience on uh, the be people behavior. Uh, so how NASA to make sure that people are safe during these experiments and are there any regulations that must be followed on such experiments? And how does NASA make sure that their people are safe during these experiments? Well, people are monitored quite extensively. There are cameras inside the dome that film continuously the common areas for research, but that would allow to detect an emergency. Um, then we have a, there is an emergency phone that can be used, like uh, exactly if there is an emergency and there is like the simulations need to stop for safety reasons, we have a way to contact uh, health. And then there are some procedures which are which have been developed for basically any uh, possible emergency. For instance, if there is a volcanic eruption, there would be a helicopter taking us up. Um, so we were so we were isolated, but we were quite monitored. So there was no like NASA is very careful about the safety of the test subjects. No, it's easy. Why should I repeat all the questions? Come, come upstairs and ask the question directly. Um, just, it's easier. Hello, next question here. All right, hi. Um, so I was wondering, uh, having three months of, uh, of darkness now, uh, how, does this ha how has this um, affected your group dynamics for better or worse, or better maybe both one example for better and one example for worse? Uh, I have to say that uh, it's fine also because at the, in the middle of the winter, the 21 of uh, June, there is uh, one week of holiday. We, it's called uh, midwinter, and uh, it's one week of party, so we enjoy all together. <laughs> and it's really fun because you know that uh, uh, the, the sun is coming, uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, a good week. We wait this week from the beginning of the winter. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think this was on um, the farthest away ever keynote for EuroPython ever, and probably also the coldest one. Um, so thank you very much. I think this gave us all great insight into your work and how is life in Antarctica. Um, yeah, and thanks again and again. Thank you very much. Thank you.